Worship is one of the most complex things humans built. The pride of the Pacific was built on hard lessons. We made lots of mistakes. Innovation. This is an elevator that moves up and down on the side of the ship. And nationwide teamwork. It was an unprecedented mobilization. It's unbelievable. How the US built the boats that took back the skies. It was amazing how fast they cranked them out. The Essex class aircraft carrier. I'm Stuart Varney, and this is American Built. A war can be lost long before the battles begin. The job of any military is to figure out how to fight the next war, and failure can be a remarkable teacher if you're paying attention. During World War I, heavily armored battleships like the USS Utah ruled the Atlantic. Battleships are the, the core of sea power. They were supported by faster, lighter battle cruisers. The whole idea of a battle cruiser was to sacrifice armor for speed. Battleships and battle cruisers were focused on the sea and the land. They didn't worry much about the air. Airplanes in World War I are a very secondary proposition. They're little, they're slow, they don't go very far. After the war, the Washington Naval Treaty limited the number of warships any nation could build. They were willing to sign a treaty to avoid another arms race because they thought it meant avoiding another war. This was the war to end world wars. They take it literally. Why do you want to spend all this money on ships? All work on battleships and battle cruisers was shuttered. But there was a loophole. The treaty allowed the US to convert two unfinished cruisers into a new kind of ship. Aircraft carriers. From the catapult to the aircraft carrier, making possible the use of fast fighters and bombers in sea warfare was a logical step. Aircraft carrier projects power through aircraft. The battleship couldn't hit the carrier from as far away as the carrier could hit the battleship because the planes could travel hundreds of miles. A class of warships is named for the first one built. So these carriers were known as the Lexington class. The earlier classes are part of an evolution when the Navy is learning what a carrier is. It takes us a while to realize that the big is worth the trouble. The original Lexington was to be topped off with twin funnels and heavy guns. The revised design would get a 100-foot wide flight deck instead. Below that, a 20-foot tall hangar deck with two central elevators. They're designed to move planes from the hangar deck inside the ship up to the flight deck so that they can be launched. The problem with these elevators in the middle of the ship is that there is an elevator pit. So when the elevator goes down, it leaves holes in the flight deck. The ships were 888 feet long. Now they, were, they were huge. But these huge ships weren't intended to be carriers. There's a lot of design compromises that are made in those ships because half the ship was already built when the decision was made to make them an aircraft carrier. They didn't turn well because they were cruiser hulls built for straightforward speed. The Navy needed a carrier that was meant to be a carrier, but it still had to work within the confines of the treaty. The Washington Navy Treaty gives you a, um, like a salary cap for how much tonnage you can use for your fleet of aircraft carriers. The first carrier designed from the keel up was the Ranger. It had a wider flight deck than the Lexington, but to stay within the treaty, it had to make critical compromises. She was too slow, and they had to make her too small. Ranger didn't have any range. It didn't have a lot of uh, fuel capacity. That was the problem. And by this time, the Navy was perilously close to the treaty limit. When the Navy's almost out of tonnage, but they still want to build another carrier, um, they build the Wasp, which is a small ship. The Wasp was a, a pathetic um, compromise all the way around. It was just using up the 10,000 tons you had left on, under the treaty. However, the limits placed on the Wasp did lead to a creative breakthrough. 
they did a lot of innovative things to save weight. And one of the things they did to save weight was they used a external elevator. You have this empty space on the side. And they discovered that the stage at the Radio City Music Hall was exactly the kind of mechanism they needed, and that's what they adapted. This is an elevator that moves up and down on the side of the ship. So this means that you can move aircraft around and it's not impacting the flight deck. The deck edge elevator would work well for larger carriers too, but the Navy was out of tonnage until suddenly it wasn't. When Japan voted to leave the 1936 Naval Arms Limitation Treaty, well, it was a bonanza because we had a chance to start designing follow-on ships. When the Japanese quit the treaty system, that's like saying, oh yes, you're right. We're on the move. You're toast. The US Navy had to keep up. Designing ships for the next war is critical because ships take a long time to build. We saw thinking about this enormous war across this humongous ocean. How do you fight a war like that? Naval engineers set out to answer that question in Newport News, Virginia. At this shipyard, they would build a new generation of aircraft carrier. The USS Essex would have the speed of the Lexington, the deck of the Ranger, and the deck edge elevator of the Wasp. It would be 60 feet longer and 10 feet wider than any of its predecessors. What you see in the Essex is finally, after about 20 years of operating carrier aircraft, we figure it out. The Essex could be a game changer, but only if they could find the skilled labor to build it. So the Washington Naval Treaty crushed the shipbuilding industry. By 1939, there were serious problems with building what they need. 